Good afternoon and welcome to our second XR speaker series for the fall 2020, my name, 2021. Uh, my name is Jeremy Nelson and I'm the director of the Extended Reality Initiative at the University of Michigan, where our mission is to bring XR technologies for teaching and learning university-wide, both on campus and online. And to support that mission, we wanted to create awareness and community around XR technologies and use cases. So I'm excited to have you all join us today for a really interesting and exciting talk. Uh, today's talk will be followed by uh, a couple other talks this year. On November 4th, Professor Michael Niebling and I will participate in a live discussion titled XR for Everybody. And then on November 17th, we welcome Yulian Radu from Harvard to learn about lessons from designing augmented reality and collaborative learning. So please join us for those. We'll send out messages after this event. Today, we have an exciting talk from Kent Bai. He will be presenting about some of the new affordances of spatial computing, as well as some of the underlying principles of embodied cognition that make VR and AR a powerful medium for learning. After Kent's talk, we'll be joined by Professor of Information at the University of Michigan, Michael Niebuhr, for an open Q&A discussion with Kent and Michael. Please be sure to add any comments or questions in the chat throughout the presentation and submit questions by Q&A that will help guide our discussion. You can also upvote any of those questions to help prioritize. Since May 2014, Kent Bai has published over 1,000 Voices of VR podcast interviews. It's a lot, uh, featuring the pioneering, featuring pioneering, pioneering artists, storytellers, and technologists driving the resurgence of virtual and augmented reality. He's an oral historian, experiential journalist, and aspiring philosopher helping to define the patterns of immersive storytelling, experiential design, ethical frameworks, and the ultimate potential of XR. Please join me in welcoming Kent Bai. All right, thank you so much, Jeremy. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to, to dig in into my talk today. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, share my slides here. Okay, so uh, yeah, today I'm gonna be talking about XR for higher education. So looking at some of the experiential design perform, uh, affordances, uh, some of the ethical considerations, and then some, I guess, more pragmatic uh, production strategies as you're starting to you know, put or start to create XR experiences. So like Jeremy said, I've been doing the Voices of VR podcast since May of 2014, and I've recorded over 1,600 interviews and published over 1,000 of them now. If you haven't checked out my episode 1,000, it's a really good three-hour overview of all the landscape and potentials of XR. So uh, here's sort of the, the outline for today. I'm gonna to be giving a, a brief introduction, talking about uh, the experiential design framework that I use, uh, an educa a XR education ethics framework. So a little bit of an overview of some of them that are out there, looking at the intersections between technology and culture uh, and contexts and relations, and then models of perception and cognition uh, that are, I think, underlying a lot of the XR technologies, and then some models of presence and media theory, and then uh, uh, more of a deeper dive into XR education ethics and then a little bit of a brief survey of educational VR through the lens of this experiential design framework, and then looking at some strategies for building XR in the future. So it's quite a packed day, so let's dive right in here. Okay, so uh, if you're not familiar with virtual augmented reality, there's the mixed reality spectrum from Casino, or within the industry, it's referred to now as XR, extended reality. On one end, you have physical reality, and then on the uh, other end, you have virtual reality, and you have sort of this fusion of virtual and the real, and then augmented reality is kind of blending those two together. So if you look at Microsoft's mixed reality spectrum, which is very much inspired by Casino, you have the augmented reality on one end of the spectrum and then virtual reality. Where augmented reality, you're in the center of gravity of the context of the real world and you're overlaying other contexts on top of that. Whereas in virtual reality, you're able to do a complete context shift. No matter where you're at, you're able to go into a completely new context, which I think is a lot more immersive in that sense. So, uh, Let's start to dig into the experiential design framework that I, I personally use. And uh, just as a caveat, I guess you know my orientation is more of a philosophical in, in some sense of trying to come up with some higher level uh, analytic frameworks or just from my own sense of as I go through experiences, this is the way that I sort of categorize and remember things. It's almost like this is my memory palace for how I remember my own direct phenomenological experiences as I go through XR experiences. And I think as, as this type of experiential design, it's almost like a model of consciousness 
matches up with the the broader learning theory, then I expect to see the learning theory to continue to evolve and grow and to uh, more fully uh, take advantage of all the affordances of XR. So it's a, some of the point here is to kind of do that higher level philosophical theorizing that could hopefully provide some guidance and some context into all the other theories that are out there. So experience, if we just get down to the nuts and bolts, it's the process of doing and seeing things and having things happen to you. So I think there's a time element, but there's also a lot of other things of doing and seeing things. So what does that mean? Um, when I think about uh, you know experiences, I also think about the context of stories and storytelling. And Robert McKee has this quote that the true character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice of the, the character's essential nature. So essentially, if I'm breaking this down, you have a protagonist who's placed within some sort of context, some level of domains of human experience. They're making choices and they're taking action. And then through that, through the story, their character is revealed. Or, you know, in some sense, this is some sort of change or transformation. Generally, if you look at processes unfolding over time, there's a start and then there's an end. And I think that's the essence of all experiences is that they they happen over time, things happen to you, and then things change. So if we're going to dig into the nuances of virtual and augmented reality, I think it's helpful to look at all the other communication media through this lens of, say, you know, the agency that you get from video games or you get, um, you know, uh, the internet and mobile phones and you have the mental and social presence of the abstractions of language and being able to communicate with people. You have film, which is much more of a passive receptive, you know, a building and releasing of tension that uh, has a lot of lighting and music that really is driven to, to uh, give you an emotional experience. Uh, music and scores like that also do that. And then augmented and virtual reality are adding this level of environmental and embodied presence that has been in theater and architecture but you're, and, and as well as dance, but really bringing all the sensory experience into computing, which I think is a new affordance that virtual and augmented re reality provide. But VR and AR are also including all these other previous media. So the way that I think about it is active presence, mental and social presence, emotional presence, and embodied and environmental presence. Now, there isn't like a universally accepted or agreed upon theory of presence, but this just so happens to be the one that I use and find helpful as I go through experiences myself, but also talk to creators. So it's taking action, making choices, uh, some degree of emotional immersion, and then your direct sensory experiences that are, are there that you have. Now, the other aspect is the context. So there's lots of different contexts and domains of human experience. We happen to be in an educational context and talking about educational XR, but there's also medical XR. There's uh, XR for you know being able to do a training uh, or um, hanging out with friends or being able to document, you know, your own memories and hanging out with your, your family or, you know, the big ones around entertainment and, you know, expression of yourself and identity. So these, I think, are helpful to be able to help uh, show all the different contexts that are um, the industry verticals, but also this comes up a lot when talking about ethical issues, which we'll be digging into more later. Uh, so again, this, this true character being revealed. And so, you know, you're put into a context and then you know, this aspect of a character. So what is the character of an experience? And, and it is about learning? Is it about, you know, expressing your courage? Um, so there's some aspect of, you know, experiences that have some character dimension to it. Um, so again, you know, protagonist put into a context, put under pressure, making choices, taking action, and then some sort of uh, character is revealed or transformation or change or learning happens over time. Okay, so the 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 happening over time is that process. It's the story, and you know, there's lots of different models in terms of you know Joseph Campbell's hero's journey to be able to look at it. There's the three act structure. There's you know Dan Harmon's uh, story circles that has this you know going out and then going into chaos and having order. So kind of cycling through order and chaos until you um, you know building and releasing of that tension or or struggling and then learning and understanding. Uh, Alex McDowell has another model which you know has where storytelling used to be much more communal, and then we got into communication media, which had these canonical versions that became much more linear. But now we're moving into this more post-linear where things are becoming more interactive, more participatory. So a lot of the media is like this insights from video games and and gamification, and you know expressing your agency and actually becoming a participant within the story itself. Um, and, and again, this spectrum between whether or not the story is authored and you're just passively receiving it, or whether or not you have the capability to be uh, dynamically engaging with it, interacting with it in some ways where you're able to express your agency and your will into the experience and the experience is able to listen to that and respond to it. 
So again, this is sort of the essence of the 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 parts of the framework, the context and the character and the and this and the, the quality of the experience, the, the context quality and the character and, and, and the story that unfolds over time. So uh, let's look at some of the XR educational ethics frameworks, which I think is a good place to sort of blend together ethics and education, and then we'll be diving into more of you know the fusion of these things together. So uh, there's an, a relatively new uh, E3XR. This is the analytical framework for ethical, educational, and eudaimonic XR design for, by Joy Lee and Elliot Huao, where there's like three or three tiers where there's a baseline of ethics of do no harm. There's the educational learning that you're trying to do with all the different learning goals and whatnot. And then there's the kind of the self-actualized flourishing eudaimonia where you're kind of ascending to your full potential. Um, you can kind of think about it as the ethical stuff as the baseline things you definitely want to have. And then if you have time and resources, then you can start to think about all these other things that um, are going to be as inclusive and 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 as ethical as you possibly can. It's hard to to do everything perfectly, and so there's always going to be some level of trade off. So, what you determine to be ethics and what you determine to be eudaimonia, I think, is going to actually be very de dependent on the context of the experience that you're creating. It's going to change from from different experiences. But you know, they they sort of map out some of the low to high of you know the the if you're not ethical, this is what you do. Uh, in terms of surveillance capitalism, negative transference, and all these other aspects, and then the positive aspects, uh, and then education. There, you know, there's there's sort of best practices of of education where you you're you're trying to do something that's beyond passive transmissions and didactic, just a dumping of information and getting into more situated learning, social constructivism, procedural knowledge, pre preparation for future learning, uh, you know, um, project based learning, all these things that you're actually immersing yourself in in constructing the knowledge. Uh, and then you have Monia again. This is their own take on that. Uh, but again, you sort of have this for for them. They're 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 creating this polarity between the low and high. And I think it just helps them to start to say, okay, here's if you do nothing, or here's if it's a bad situation, and here's the more exalted uh, things that you we should try to do, and some resources there. And by the way, I'll be posting all these slides so you can refer to this later if you want to dig into some more of these resources. Um, and my my particular approach, I try to take a little bit more of a spatial approach of trying to map out all these different contexts. And I'll be digging into this a little bit later in terms of just an overview of all the different ethical issues that I see. But I, I'm a very spatial learner, so I like to kind of try to map things out spatially to kind of understand things a little bit more. So um, again, this is the, from my XR Ethics Manifesto. There's no lack of different ethical issues that you have within XR uh, and this interface between you know humanities or culture with technology. Uh, but just some other different frameworks to throw out there. I know that um, Erica Southgate has a book of virtual reality and curriculum pedagogy. She has her action pedagogy for immersive learning where she starts to break out the teacher realm, the learner realm, and the technical realm. So separating out the different stakeholders, which I think is a theme that I see in other frameworks as well. Uh, another example is the Arlene, which is an augmented reality uh, learning and analytics ethical framework, and I'll, I'll have two slides to break into this more, but it takes a very similar approach of looking at the different stakeholders, the educators, the students, and the developers, and looking at the different, you know, interfaces of how the technology interfaces with the education theory and the psychology and, you know, how all these things are kind of related to each other and then the analytics to be able to drive it. Um, and then, yeah, again, this is just a, another take of kind of mapping out these different contexts and seeing how the 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 stakeholders and the people and the human experience are interfacing with the technology. Um, so I, for me, those get a little bit confusing sometimes. And so I have sort of a, a meta framework that helps me map out some of these different relational dynamics. And so I just want to sort of step through that because I, I I find it really helpful to really analyze this relationship between people and culture and you know all these different dynamics. So less sympathetic dot theory is something that I I came across through going to the decentralized web community and. Uh, they, they use it a lot. I think the Internet Archive and the Electronic Frontier Foundation actually uses this for a lot of the basis for how they work. But they look at this intersection between cultural norms, the law, the market dynamics, and the technological architecture and the code. The way that Lessig describes this, it's almost like these are social, political, cultural dials that you can turn. Uh, but because they're at the collective scale, you, you turn it, but you don't get immediate feedback. And so you're always trying to balance some combination of what the was responsible by the culture, what where do you need to have policy and law step in, what are going to be market dynamics to be able to sort things out, and then what are the underlying technological and architecture to be able to solve the problem. So I think any sufficiently difficult ethical issue within technology is some combination of all these things, which makes it even more intractable and, and difficult to, to try to navigate. 
But for me, I also try to look at this in terms of the nested context, because uh, I find that there's actually things that are kind of a center of gravity or the, the largest context. And so um, this is some inspiration from Alfred North Whitehead that I'll get into uh, in, a, in a moment. But just to sort of flesh this out, uh, this is the blessed pathetic dot theory, which sort of has it as these are independent entities and there are ways in which they uh, are interfacing with each other, but they, and sometimes they are unique actors. And so, you know, this is one way of thinking about it, but I like to think about it as at the broadest, there's the culture and you always have the education and the things that the people can do, but it's also the hardest to control because you, you have human nature. And then you have laws that are set within the context of that culture uh, that are set by the law, by the government. Uh, which dictates the what the what sort of the context of the economy and the market dynamics that you have with all the antitrust and everything else with privacy and all the other laws that are are creating these market dynamics, and then you have the design guidelines, which are sort of independent creators and, and ethicists and experiential designers who are coming in within the context of the laws and the economy, but these are more kind of left up to the culture in some ways for designing experiences in an ethical way, and that's kind of where we're talking about here. You know, how do we do that? Then there's the actual user experience of whatever experience you're creating. And then uh, you have an application that you've created, which is some of the technological architecture on the code, the operating system, and then the hardware and the tech architecture. So you can kind of see this uh, myriological hierarchy where there's the broader context. And of course, there's going to be feedback loops between all these. And so it's not like this is um, you know a one-way street here, but I do see that this is a helpful way that I found at least of, of making sense of a lot of this. So if you look at some of these different ways of looking at how the technology interfaces with society and there's different layers of security engineering and you know mandated covenants and restrictions and what you're doing with the application and, and, and uh, what, what the what the third party developers are able to do within the context of that and then the user experience and then you know sort of these more higher level things. Um, and this is another way of looking at it, which is that you have, uh, in some sense, these higher level human rights principles that, are, that aren't that are clearly binding by any laws, but they inform the laws and the governments. Uh, so the laws, the, the governments, you know, sign on to the treaty and then it becomes part of their local law to be able to follow. But then those are feeding into the XR companies, but they're creating the hardware. So a lot of this interfaces with the context of the hardware is actually infused with dealing with all the sort of user terms of service and policies of these XR companies. It's not like agnostic technology that you can just use a lot of times. But here we are in terms of the ethical design principles that are trying to inform the, the laws and trying to inform both the, the architecture that the companies are building, but also the different XR experiences that are first party and third party experiences that are then being provided by users. So just to flesh this out, just to show how kind of complicated this can get is if we look at something like privacy, you can see how, you know, Right here, you have that any op, any way that you're going to actually interface with the technology, you have to go through the policy, the terms of service and the policy, right? So you're, the users are consenting to be able to go through all this stuff. So whatever laws may be there, as long as you consent, then there's basically like some of these privacy laws are no longer apply because it's all about, you know, did the user consent or not? So there may be things around, uh, you know, the, the neuroethics and the, the neuro rights where, you know, what kind of things are we doing with, the biometric psychography data and and are, is that being monetized? There's kind of like once that data gets into the hands of these companies, then it's a little bit of you. It's a black box. You can't really see and have any transparency as a user. But over here, the ethical design principles. There's you know ways to be able to try to advocate and you know make recommendations to to potentially create new laws for so this technology. And then those laws then feed into the XR companies. But there's also the higher international law, so you can go to the UN and create, you know, more of a human rights approach, which then creates principles and the neuro rights initiative. And then, you know, these fundamental rights to privacy, which then uh, informs this, but also there's a UN guiding principles of business and human rights, which then also is kind of like a backdoor feeding into these companies, but the enforcement of that is not as big. Uh, so again, this is just, you know, some way of, of showing anything where there's like a red line, there's some open questions in terms of like the third party developers, they, they have some ways in which that they're supposed to follow the, the developer terms of service, but how is that being enforced and how are they designing ethical print, uh, you know, things that are aligned with sort of a baseline of ethics. So again, this, for me, this shows a lot of these different stakeholders and the relationships. And it, it also points to what I think of is this process philosophy of how things are really kind of related to each other. So uh, Alfred North Whitehead is the founder of process philosophy. And, you know, rather than seeing that the nature of reality is based upon uh, physical objects, he really said that 
uh, reality is all about these relations and patterns and relationships. And if you go down to the quantum level and you really dig down in, into quantum ontology, it's really about patterns of energy that are in relationship to each other. Um, so, you know, I'm a big fan of process philosophy because I think that at the heart of a lot of these things, it's mapping out what the relationships are between these different stakeholders and trying to also figure out how to, you know, turn the dials to be able to, to leverage these complex nonlinear um, systems. But he also came up with this concept of mirrorology, which I, I sort of alluded to, but it's this, you know, mirrorology is the study of the holes and the parts. And so if you look at atoms are part of molecules, are part of organelles and cells and tissues. And so you have these sort of uh, increasing levels of complexity. And so a lot of uh, Western philosophy is sort of based upon physics, where you're you're looking at things in terms of like the most, you know, the, the, the smallest things you can reduce down to. But for Whitehead, he really wanted to make things the basis of biology. So he is saying that you could use biological metaphors to look at even physics to be able to say, hey, even if you look at an atom, it's really a pattern of energy that is defined by this mathematical equation. And you can start to look at it in more of an ecological sense because you have things that are both at a higher level that are kind of like fractal geometry ways in which that you have things that are talking to each other at the smaller scale. So things can be both a, a whole within themselves, but also a part of a larger thing. So I think this sort of mariology and holes and parts is fundamental for so many different concepts with immersive technologies, especially things like embodied cognition. But uh, this is a slide just to sort of dig into more information from uh, handbook of mariology to the quantum of explanation and untying the Gordian knot and quantum ontology and extensional, extensional mariology. You know, in essence, the Whitehead's metaphysics has like a whole new basis of reality that, you know, if, if you want to dig into that a little bit more, some of these books are, are good, especially untying the Gordian knot, which is a recent book from Timothy Eastman, who is a, a NASA plasma physicist who's kind of tying in aspects of process reality and context. So again, context, I want to sort of point out that a lot of sort of traditional reductive materialism will sometimes ignore the context, but the context comes in in the peer review, making sure that, you know, it's, you're, you're, you've considered all the different contextual dimensions so that the data that you've come up with is relevant. Uh, but uh, with virtual reality, I think it, it is so much about the context. So I think I just want to point that out that this sort of goes down to the basis of reality that you can't ever have anything that's absence of the context of the measurement. All right. So Mariology, again, sort of this sort of nested context is a concept that for me has been really crucial of, of helping to have a sense-making framework for understanding ethics. But it's also a big framework for understanding cognition because you see this kind of mariological structure between the brain, the body, and the environment. We, we used to think about cognition as just being a part of the brain, but as we look in more and more neuroscience, we see how so much about the way our brain works is through embodied action, through actually moving your body and having these spatialized metaphors that um, are, are not disconnected from our own direct embodied experiences. And so our embodied experiences are informing everything that we understand about the world and the environment around us. And so there's a sort of a distributed cognition aspect as well, so that we're not an isolated part from the world around us, but that our brain, body, and environment are really all tied together. One of the things that spatial computing does is it really delivers the full contextual aspects of that environment that allows you to do things that you know are able to transport you. And so what are the other aspects of there? So that's what I'll be digging to here in the next phase. But just to kind of you know wrap up some of the mariological concepts, and there's another way of looking at the embodied cognition where you can see like sort of nested context between your brain activity, physical activity, and the, the, the world around you and this loop of perception and action. Um, here's a way of looking at the evolution of communication media itself where you have writing and then, well, I actually don't know if theater or came first before writing, but let's just say that writing came first and then theater, then film, radio, TV, video games, internet, mobile phone, and VR and AR, where each of these media are kind of including all the aspects of the previous media, but also creating new affordances that weren't in the pre in that previous media when you have mass media being able to communicate that. So uh, again, I'd like to, you know, I'll be sort of referring to this again, just sort of remind people that VR and AR is actually a culmination of all these other media. And also and thinking mariological means moving away from a linear process of production from pre-production, post-production and uh, pre-production, post-production and post <laughs> pre-production, production and post-production. And you move into more of an iterative process where you're, you're creating something, but you're measuring it and you're seeing what your human experience is responding to it because it's impossible to model human experience. So you actually have to build it and experience it for yourself. So there's a huge theme that I see over and over and over again within XR, which is this kind of iterative approach. And I think at the heart of it is this kind of 
process relational way of thinking about. So, okay, so that's the tech culture. And now I'm going to dive into briefly some of the different models of perception and cognition. Uh, so given that sort of you know, mirror logical approach, I think a lot of these different aspects of perception are very process related. You know, there's a loop. These loops are kind of going again and again and again, and it sort of never stops. So, but first let's just, this is just one, you know, Roth's model of ludo narrative meaning making, which is trying to, at the high level, map out the relationship between the designer and the interactor and the technology. Again, you have this kind of like the stakeholders between someone making the experience and someone's experiencing it. And then the conceptual models and the intentions that are all behind that. Um, then you have different cognitive processes for uh, external stimuli where you have different aspects like emotion and cognition and behavior, mental representations, working memory. These are all the ways of trying to break down the component parts of, of the brain. And, you know, neuroscientists have a wide variety of different models for trying to understand this. Uh, and there's some, some kind of leading theories, I guess, that are out there in terms of trying to, at a high level, describe what is happening when we think about our cognition. Uh, there's different information processing and presence models. There's uh, Dustin Chertoff, which, you know, a lot of Traditional presence models were very focused on the embodied experience, but trying to sort of expand out into these other aspects of all these other aspects of the cognition. I think um, this has been a challenge within the VR industry because in some sense, presence is in essence is like a comprehensive model of consciousness. And consciousness is one of the most mysterious things and from a philosophical and a scientific perspective. So it's no wonder that we don't have like a really good you know framework around it because we're still trying to make sense of how to do that. But I actually think that experiential design is a good lens to start to look at what our, our consciousness is when you look at perception and cognition and these experiences and see how people respond to it. And I think education is actually going to be on the leading edge of leading edge of trying to come up with whatever your own, you know, favorite model of consciousness and what model you're going to use to see if you're able to actually get uh, results, empirical results from folks. So again, a body cognition is a, a huge part that has come up again and again and again, uh, that is seeing that our brain is not just a thing that you can, you know, quantify, but it's actually this holistic thing that is this feedback loop with your full body and the environment as well. Uh, again, sort of this perception action loop within the context of your activity and the environment. Um, this is a, a slide that was presented at one, one of the keynote lectures at the IEEE by Frank Steinecke. And he has the perception, cognition, action. In his actual presentation, he sort of you know goes through and layers of uh, stuff. This is just sort of the final slide here. But um, in some sense, the virtual and augmented reality technologies are interfacing with your perception. So there's perceptual filtering, there's selective attention, there's motor adaptation, there's ways that the virtual environments are able to use different aspects of our own cognition and, and kind of take it to the extreme in terms of, you know, almost like a magic show, what you're able to do to, you know, convince people that they're actually there. Uh, but there's all these feedback loops between, you know, your, your senses and your perception and your motor commands. You know, the biggest part of the brain is your motor cortex, which is all about movement. And so your body is movement and, um, you know, moving is thinking is, is what one neuroscientist, uh, uh, told me. So, uh, you know, the predictive, predictive coding theory of neuroscience is also something that has come up a number of times for me, which is an essence that your brain is a prediction machine. It is having all sorts of models of what reality is, and then it has the direct sensory experience. And you're always kind of comparing what your experience is with what your model is. So if you've had a lot of immerse, a lot of in real life immersed experience, and then you have like a simulacrum of that, then you may actually feel more deeper presence by being that because you actually have a lot of direct embodied experiences that are being catalyzed when you're in that immersive experience. And so there's this, this loop between what your mind expects and what your direct experiences are. So this is a predictive coding theory of neuroscience. So again, you have the active engagement, you have the error feedback, which when there's a gap, then your body gets lots of dopamine to correct the error. So novelty ends up being a, a big catalyst for learning because your brain wants to make accurate predictions. And if you make wrong predictions, then that's an opportunity to, to become, uh, to, to learn and to kind of adapt. So you have the, the, the consolidation process that is integrating all these new learnings. And then you have your direct attention of your embodied experiences. And you kind of have this loop between uh, attention and active engagement, uh, error feedback and consolidation. This is from uh, How We Learn by uh, Stanislas uh, Dean. So at the heart of it though, if I was trying to boil it down to like the, the most simple, it's like you have a direct sensory experience of reality and you have the mental models of reality. And there's this feedback loop of going back and forth between those. And in that you have the mental model and lived experience, but you have 
uh, the belief in doubt. So this is sort of getting into the dialectical, dialectical nature of epistemology. So knowledge, how do we know what is true? You can put forth what you believe, but you want to also test it and have some doubt. And so uh, Agnes Callard says that that's actually a two separate algorithms of belief and doubt that you can't do simultaneously, which is why we need the scientific process to be able to put forth a, you know, a hypothesis that you've tested and have some data for, but have it reviewed by the larger peer review process, because we want to make sure that you didn't miss anything or that it's, it's actually saying what you actually think it's saying. And then obviously you want to have some replication to be able to for sure, uh, find that that whatever finding you found is actually true. So I think this actually gets into like, um, aspects of education, which is like, how do you do assessment? How do you know if people have actually learned after you go through experience, they may be really immersed and there's higher engagement, but are there actually better out learning outcomes? And I think that's probably one of the aspects of having good theory uh, of ex experiential design and then finding ways to actually be able to test it. So contest and confirm, uh, destabilize and stabilize. So this process of the dialectic between belief and doubt um, as, a, as a fundamental part of not only knowledge and epistemology, but also the learning process. All right. So I'll dive into now some models of presence uh, and media theory. I've talked about my experiential design framework, but I wanted to also just you know give some shout outs to some other um, theories if you want to get more context and more information. Ag again, what I find is that there's a lot of times where these theories of presence will, will have not only the phenomenological first person perspective, but they'll start to uh, take in different aspects of the technology or the environment. Um, so this is sort of a survey that Dustin Chertoff did in 2009 in the summer for his, uh, you know, one of his dissertation. But there's also uh, in 2009, there is the Slater's place illusion and plausibility illusion, which I find is actually really sort of baseline uh, understanding for the place illusion is that you are tricked for all your sensory motor contingencies that you're actually in another place. And the plausibility illusion is that you believe that it's real. So you, you have enough that your suspension of disbelief, there's enough in the world that coheres enough that you understand it. And for me, when I think about the place illusion and plausibility illusion, I think about it as the sort of embodied and environmental presence where you actually feel like your body is in another place. And the plausibility is that your mind is understanding and cohering that everything seems plausible. Now, plausibility has also come from agency and interacting and interrogating. So there's elements of like the actor presence and, you know, there's aspects of the, to really feel like you're in another place of having all the, and, and you know, sound design and music and, and other things that I would sort of say is emotional immersion. The difference between emotional immersion and embodied immersion, I mean, <laughs> this is sort of impossible to really, you know, finely tune or measure. Uh, so that's why I, in some ways, prefer to take a little bit more of a philosophical approach uh, rather than uh, trying to uh, show it empirically. But I think having the need to kind of empirically understand some of these things is important. But like I said, this is at the same time trying to, you know, have the frontiers of trying to understand a model consciousness, which can be very difficult when there's all these things that are happening all at the same time. Uh, another thing that I've uh, found after I did my sort of, you know, elemental theory of presence was Dustin Chertoff uh, using these insights from marketing. So uh, experiential design, comes from the marketing field and it was used to kind of encourage people to create these meaningful emotional and social connections to a product. And so um, Chartoff talks about, you know, these dimensions uh, to create an experience that's known as experiential design. Um, Pine and Gilmore is another big reference in terms of looking at, you know, the experience economy. But uh, from there, from the experience economy is this, you know, advertising and marketing was using these aspects of the sensory, cognitive, effective, active and relational. And so when I look at those on my mapping, I see the active presence, the cognitive and relational, the sensory experience and the effective. And, you know, I have a little bit different terminology, but I think in essence, it's the same in terms of the active presence, mental and social presence, emotional presence, embodied and environmental presence. Uh, but I wanted to just also give a shout out. There's, there's continued to be more research in presence. And, you know, this is no, by no means a subtle thing. Uh, Richard Scarbez is someone I've done a couple of interviews with, and he's somebody who's, you know, trying to map out all these different aspects of place illusion and all the different research and all the different, you know, dimensions of that, you know, he's, he's gone through and tried to map out, you know, here are the different dimensions of presence that all these other different uh, researchers have found and, and trying to map them out in some ways. And so, again, there's the in sensory motor uh, uh, actions, you know, the body the coherence, your mind, the mental perception, the environmental co coherence in terms of the, does the world feel real social co coherence for me is like social presence and the effective valid actions, um, you know, sort of both a combination of the, the agency and feeling like you're able to actually engage with experiences. So again, this is a uh, kind of a high level mapping that he came up with in his 
talk, we're talking about presence and social presence illusion, the place illusion, the possibility illusion, co-presence. And, you know, uh, for me, I would add like the, the, there's an element of emotions that are also in there that, um, you know, trying to measure that and, and, uh, and integrate that into the, this framework is, is probably the one thing that's not uh, included. But anyway, this, going back to like at the heart, there's these different communication media and these different media have different affordances like video games with agency and, you know, with the internet and World Wide Web and your mobile phone being able to connect and social media and transmit knowledge and look up things and Google things and be able to read and, and use language to communicate and, uh, you know, the visual communication styles of film and the way you're able to edit and also the aspects of the embodied experiences where you're able to actually give people a direct embodied experience. Okay, so brief things about media theory, and then I'll dive into some of the education ethics, and then you know some of the layering theory, and you know as we wrap up here in the last fifteen minutes or so. So I think another aspect of not only there's the aspects of of the media, but there's also sort of the mass media, which is that you have all these communication media and how they're out there, and there's this uh, media taxonomy that I came across from 2019 that breaks it down. And it's, you know, again, you know, trying to break down all these different things that are fairly complicated and I'll try to sort of step through it, make some sense and sort of compare it to how I tend to think about some of the same things. So Bernard Miche's definition of a medium is that there's an addition and a distribution. I think that's as like as simple as you can get it. Mass media is about trying to capture some way of communicating something through whatever the affordances of that media are to create an addition. And then you distribute it and give to people and they can experience it. So that to me is the communicate, this is the definition of the media that I find is the most simple uh, and the most easy to understand. But for, uh, kind of expanding on this definition of the medium, you can see that there's the affordances of new media that is made available with new technology and all the different combinations of, of, of the tech that's brought together. And then the artists and the creators, then they, they explore what's new possible with the new affordances of that medium. And then from there, the distributors and distribution channels provide a, an ability for the audience to be able to experience the, the whatever you've created in that media. And then the audience are able to receive that and actually experience it and learn and watch and then give feedback to this whole process. And so for me, we've been going through that with virtual and augmented reality as we get access to all this and try to integrate all these different design disciplines, try to explore what the affordances are, and then you know get people, even if you were to make the most highly advanced piece of media, the audience still has to catch up to it. So in some ways you have to have this skeuomorphic phase where it's, it's, it has enough of the connections to the previous media where they, they are not completely lost of how to, to operate this. So, you know, you see that a little bit with people who come from a gaming background and use a lot of the really high end aspects of the video game controllers. But if you haven't have that background and you're thrown in VR that is using a lot of that, that it can be a little bit more difficult because you don't have that in your own embodied experience. So again, the distribution, the addition and the distribution. So uh, just going back through this, this model from uh, Maloney, uh, there's different aspects of, of the, I'm gonna actually dive in now to each of these different uh, uh, aspects here. So the first part of the media communication, for me, I, I see that there's different uh, contexts here that are coming through, through the you know, journalism, biography, memoir, you know, political speech, cinema, uh, but there's also the different genres that are unique to each of these uh, media. And that's genre is something that I haven't necessarily integrated into my own theory. So this is really good to see this sort of acknowledgement that there's different genres for each of these media. Um, here, the for me, this is where I think about all the different actual you know communication media. The second part where the affordances of each of these media and what you can do in terms of the you know, um, dynamically interact and move. And um, also some of the different character aspects of the sweet versus sour. So each of these different media are gonna have different affordances and experiences from a phenomenological perspective, um, but also different ways of, of combining all these things as well. And the last one is really the kind of the distribution aspect for how to get that experience into different people's hands. So there's lots of different ways of, for each of these media that they, they have different networks that are out there to get to scale to actually get those experiences into the hands of the people. So again, for me, when I look at this first part, I see the different contextual dimensions there um, that are, you know, all the media have the, both the context, but there's also a genre that is unique to, you know, different ways of the different trade-offs for the media and the affordances. Uh, you know, here is the different actual pieces of the media uh, and then you have the, the actual distribution process that is down here. Um, so again, you can dive into the, the nuanced low level details. And for me, I like to have sort of a higher level thing that helps me understand uh, what's actually happening. So with that, let's dive into some of the XR education ethics uh, that I had given a little bit of a sneak preview, and then I'll sort of go through some experiences and then some strategies for building in the future. 
So in 2009, I went to the Love All Virtual Think Tank that had been doing lots of different interviews about XR ethics and privacy. We did a big brainstorm, which is just mapping out lots of different ethical issues, which is always great, you know, to get a group of people because ethics is really hard for you as an individual to know and understand all the different uh, moral and ethical dilemmas. So from there, I said, oh, well, why don't we try to map it out to these domains of human experience? Uh, and then, you know, from there, it's, it, there seemed to be a, a big contextual dimension to all, a lot of these different ethical issues. You know, on a high level, uh, this is from self and other and private to public, but, you know, really there's no comprehensive model of context. You know, this is something that because we haven't like written it down, it's, you know, a big reason why uh, common sense within artificial intelligence is difficult because it's very contextual. Uh, and context is very thing. It, it's a very difficult thing because it's almost like the invisible water that we're swimming in a lot of times. But uh, the XR Ethics Manifesto, I tried to map out all these different contexts and then go through all these different aspects of here's all the things that you need to look at and pay attention to. Uh, and that's a, a whole half hour talk. And I've given other talks, you know, that's a, within itself a whole, um, you know, hour long just to dive into all those things. But, you know, just to, to point out that there's other aspects of, say, Facebook who come up with responsible innovation dimensions, which I'd say is similarly coming up with different contextual dimensions. They had their principles, but now they're looking at things like how autonomy and safety and well-being and environmental sustainability are looking at these larger contextual dimensions that once you get at a certain scale that you have to start to take into consideration. There's also world building that also is the process of making stories and narratives, but also is pulling in all these different contextual dimensions and, and giving a take of or how those play out. Um, you know, XR Safety Initiative has their, their risk assessment that has the human context, societal context, information, financial, legal context. So, you know, breaking down these different dimensions um, as well, I point them out for that's another lens of looking at some of these different issues. Um, and then for me, I'll just quickly go through some of these different contextual issues. Uh, and for me, it's really difficult to do everything perfect because some of these things have inherent trade-offs. And I think that's sort of the challenge. Uh, but this is trying to at least give you an overview. So then when you start to implement your own experiences, then you know how to start to integrate this stuff. So you have the educational uh, impacts of avatar embodiment. What's it mean to have a body and how does that change your sense of presence and uh, having this connectivist aspect can actually have an embodiment. Um, so having a diverse selection of avatars is important to make sure that people are represented in their avatar embodiment. Um, biometric data and identity, what happens to the biometric data, it can uh, be personally identifiable. So is it being recorded? What's happening to it? So tracking what happens with biometric data. You have our threats to mental privacy, which I think is probably the, one of the biggest existential threats in general to XR. But uh, in some ways, the, the FERPA and COPA is providing some level of uh, shielding because surveillance capitalism companies like Google, or uh, well, well, like Google, but especially Facebook, are using a lot of these surveillance techniques and trying to, to gather and aggregate all this data, which is not really great in the context of education, meaning it's going to be very difficult to use Oculus products in the context of education because of that. But uh, being aware of the threats to mental privacy, even if you are wearing, using other uh, headsets beyond Oculus. The proposed neural rights, the right to identity, right to agency, right to mental privacy, right to fair access to mental augmentation, right to are you know kind of reflected in this mapping in some sense, but uh, good to look back to as well. Access to technology, you know, Google Cardboard was sort of expand out the market so it's at a critical mass before they make sure that at all levels of, of Economic, you know, uh, incomes. Do you want to do the times? So just making sure, you know, if you're uh, creating experiences that may be disrupting a larger balance of screen time that students may have, uh, depending on their age, um, biometric privacy. Uh, making sure that if you're in your home, that there's not aspects of immersive experiences that are somehow doxing yourself or uh, revealing information about your environment, escaping, creating experiences that really are trying to tap into this dopamine and escapism and addiction. And what's the line between what's too addictive, what's too escapist, you know, being aware of <clears throat> traumas to trigger. So if you can, if, uh, if VR can help to heal trauma, it can also cause trauma. So 
what are the ways in which that these immersive experiences could potentially tra trigger different trauma experiences with people being aware of those uh, VR motion sickness. And so just designing experiences don't that don't make people sick. <clears throat> the ethics of using biometric feedback. So biometric feedback is going to be a huge part in the future of education to be on this real time measuring of cognitive load. But then what are the ways in which is that used as assessment? Um, you know, are there ways that, that could be used in a wrong way to maybe, maybe the, the measurements aren't fully capturing everything. And if you're using that as a basis of learning, then, you know, maybe people that don't, um, are rating that, you know, what is kind of being skeptical of what the limits of those biometric data are showing you. <clears throat> Virtual harassment and bullying is a big thing within social VR in the broader context and education context that may be a little bit less important, but still important. You want to have personal space bubbles and kind of the baseline of if people are going to be pseudo anonymous or, you know, somewhat, you might be able to track people's identity, but you want to be able to have different ways of addressing different issues of harassment and bullying within a virtual context and don't want to create a context where it's easier to harass or bull bully people. <clears throat> virtual violence, uh, you know, having experiences that have violence, what are the impacts there? Uh, virtual being influencers and the degree to which that we project our, our different aspects of our uh, anthropomorphic uh, projections onto AI. <clears throat> the Office of Education Technology, you have different things like FERPA and COPA and SIPA that are from the government that are putting certain limitations in terms of, you know, COPA is like you can't have children under 13. So uh, if, if it's on an application like um, Facebook's and so there's certain limitations that Facebook's not COPA compliant. So just to be aware of that. Algorithmic bias. So the ways in which the, the algorithms may be unduly impacting people. And so uh, having whatever training you're doing on the algorithms be diverse, but also be aware that there could be harm that is coming from the algorithms that you have within your experience. And then finally, accessibility. If you are going to be making immersive experiences, then just making it sure that it's accessible for everybody that is, uh, you know, going to be within the class, which is a, kind of a, a, an area within XR that is still very nascent in terms of it progressing. So this is again a kind of overview of all these different things. Um, and again, I'll have the slides you can go back and look into more detail. But I like this contextual uh, approach just to be able to help map out the different things and just to help to kind of brainstorm different aspects as well. Again, coming back to this, you know, e, uh, E3XR, where you have the ethics, education, eudaimonia, uh, separating what's the eudaimonia versus ethics is going to be very context dependent. But I think there's this agile iterative process where you want to do a baseline of doing all the basic ethical harm, uh, you know, considerations. And then as you progress, then you want to be able to um, add more and more aspects of things that are, you know, in that flourishing aspect. Uh, okay. So, uh, I'm, I'm just for a few more minutes, I'm going to go through some of the different survey of educational XR and some strategies for building, and then we'll move on to the discussion and some questions. So um, as I do just a brief uh, look at some of the, some of the top uh, disciplines, there's different ways in which that there's early adopters and early majority and late majority. So these are the different types of uh, things that I tend to see in terms of the experiences that I've come across. Uh, and some of these here in the early majority and not as much in the late majority. Again, this is totally subjective, but as I start to map this out, you know, there's a lot of things in entertainment and art and design and performance. There's a lot of things in architecture. There's lots of communications and education aspects and some of these different aspects of biology, chemistry, computer science, uh, some physics stuff. Uh, and then also if you look at, you know, training, uh, for different, uh, medical training and whatnot, um, uh, but the, the, the ways in which that people adopt the immersive technologies are not evenly distributed because some things like architecture as an example are just kind of like a no brainer or, you know, uh, video game design. Uh, they're already kind of in the 3D pipeline and there's ways in which that some disciplines are gonna be e like more well suited to be able to not only start creating experiences, but have like an early win of like, like a, things that are gonna be very easy to see the learning impacts that's going to come from an XR experience, but that's not true for every experience, uh, for every discipline, I think. And so I think there's going to be a diffusion of this out uh, in this kind of phased approach, iterative approach. Um, so again, looking at active presence, mental social presence, embodied presence, and emotional presence, if we look at some of the different learning paradigms, you know, behaviorism, co cognitivism, constructivism, connectivism. Um, you can see that for me, at least, uh, experiential design is probably going to be incorporating elements of all of these. And so and when I start to try to map these out, um, you know, there's also the humanist, uh, which has more effective and cognitive needs, but, you know, stimuli and environment and internal cognitive structuring, the interactive with persons, you know, as I look at these, I start to say, well, maybe we could say like active presence is kind of like, you know, behaviorism, which is more about your, your active behavior of how you're actually behaving within environments. Uh, there's action-based learning, which is how you're engaging and interacting. 
So the cognitivist and the social learning. So there's ways in which the social presence is having this sort of social constructivist aspects of learning. And then the cognitivist is the, you know, the mental models and the structures of the underlying aspects of that. Um, and then the constructivist and the experiential, that's probably the one where is the one where you have the biggest ones within VR and XR and AR, because you're creating these immersive experiences to give people an, a direct experience. And from that direct experience comes the learning. So the constructivist, a constructivist also, I think, has a lot of agency and interactivity as well. But I think at the center of gravity, it's experiential and the embodied experience, your direct embodied experiences uh, that you're learning from. And the humanist approach, the more the effective and the emotional immersion, um, that's probably one that is probably the least theorized. As I talked to Joey Lee, he said that, you know, uh, learning theory within the context of XR is probably vastly under theorized. And I think, you know, this is kind of like my take of giving some higher level organizing structures to then maybe give some insights for how to combine some of these different aspects, because in this model, all of these things are all happening at the same time. Your uh, active presence and social mental presence and embodied environmental presence and emotional presence, but there's context, which is where there's going to be a, a center of gravity of one or the other. And I think that's the essence of experiential design is modulating how you're mixing all these things together. So I'm just going to go through some different experiences just as a brief survey. Um, and to give you some design inspiration references. So embodied and uh, environmental presence, you have you know the target platform and whether it's a, the, on the spectrum of mixed reality spectrum, scale is a big thing when it comes to environmental presence and the affordance of XR, specialized audio and what kind of 3D topology you have from 2D textures to light fields and voxels. And whether it's captured versus generated, so you have volumetric capture in a 360 video or it's a computer generated, you have the uh, generated uh, capture versus generated audio, avatar embodiment, haptic feedback, biometric feedback, motion sickness, comfort, smell, you know, the embodied environmental presence is the most robust of all these new affordances. And so just as we go through some of the different experiences that I've seen, you know, Titans of Space really leveraging scale. You have lots of different things like going at small scale with like microcosm worlds and or in mind to VR going into the brain, um, nanoscape VR going into the nanoscape. So changing scale is a big theme that I see a lot of immersive experiences and anything that deals with kind of myriologically nested scales, I think is going to be an interesting thing to explore the secrets of soil. So looking at soil from that sort of um, that, that uh, micro context, mitosis, another one. And then the side glass view is starting to look at different medical imaging and looking at different cross sections of that and seeing what you can learn from that. Uh, taking uh, experiences out to archaeological digs and actually giving you the sense of environmental presence of taking you to a place. Uh, there's a piece that uh, was at SIGGRAPH a number of years that also did that. Um, Colosseum, so being able to take people into the past and you know have them embodied within these these worlds and give them a sense of actually being there. And or going into like a virtual museum to be able to take a, a guided tour of these different artifacts. Kai XR, uh, Kai Frazier is doing a lot of that, of bringing access to a lot of these uh, museums and experiences to underrepresented minorities, but also giving them access to show people who have careers in these things and to be able to have them have these virtual interactions with people that have um, careers. So uh, that's another thing. Mokov Arts, another thing of just taking these guided tours, Aja VR, so cultural heritage aspects of taking these to these different religious places and um, the point doubt, this is like a point cloud data visualization of, of, of caves. And so having different things beyond just like 3D textures and, you know, 360 video, there's a lot of stuff from VR, 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 and as well as YouTube to be able to actually take people and show them these different videos, you know, the training simulation from fire protection, being immersed within that and seeing how you react. <clears throat> so then moving on to active presence, um, you know, narrative agency, locomotion, trace of agency, reactive behavior and the interactions. <clears throat> So we have things like Hollow Lab Chappians. It's, I think it's probably the most gamified education experience that I've seen. It's a really great way of having you do basically lab experience, uh, chemistry lab experiences, and really able to express your agency and, and have that kind of like active learning. Um, but there's also things like from the uh, lab training VR to kind of uh, do some different training where you're interacting and maybe doing things wrong. Uh, surgical training where you're able to actually get the embodied experiences of, of expressing your agency. Uh, you know, the escape room of, of using escape room tropes to, to be able to teach different aspects of having to connect, like you got to escape the room, but you have to figure out the chemistry there. Uh, the Stanford Ocean as acidification, there's different interactions that Jeremy Balenson had in this experience. Um, so then moving on to the, the last two, mental and social presence. So the telepresence and virtual beings, avatar fidelity, audience size, and BCI cognition. <clears throat> so engage uh, is a big platform for education uh, to be able to have these immersive experiences. 
uh, virtual beings and being able to have uh, virtual beings and um, in interacting with them in some ways. Uh, a, a clever label, uh, so sort of having mapping of different ways of the sort of the uh, mapping relationships, uh, being able to see what those relationships are. I think that's a lot of the connectivist type of ideas uh, to be able to, to draw connections between these things. Or the alter show to be also kind of create these nodal connections within uh, spatial computing. Uh, but also the data visualizations and to show like uh, pandemic by prisms to show how the pan the pandemic spreads and how many people are kind of impacted, but having an embodied experience there to see that um, sort of spatial representation of that data or to overlay uh, the map on top of an embodied experience, like great pyramid VR to be able to, to overlay what's happening behind it. You have the embodied experience, but also have this sort of higher level uh, map on top of this uh, actual experience. Nano VR, I think, is a really great experience in terms of just interacting with correcting, uh, creating molecules and biology. There's materials VR, again, d digging in and building into the low-level nanomaterials and calc flow for mathematics and be able to actually engage with mathematical equations and change them and see how they move. Playing with 4D tools, so actually engaging with four-dimensional objects and uh, being able to actually draw things out on a, a, a whiteboard, on dry erase the infinite VR whiteboard but also just uh, to be able to memorize different aspects of anatomy with the share UVR and a share, um, share care UVR. So finally, the emotional presence, you have the embodiment and, and metaphors and how time it flows and the emotional expression and empathy. So there's a lot of the empathy things like actually empathizing with what's it like to, to live with an intellectual disability or to what's it like to, to be homeless or um, to actually just receive a lot of the different uh, research that Stanford v uh, has been doing. It's actually a great way of, of transmitting VR research and uh, virtual re virtual becomes reality. Uh, Once Upon a Sea is a, a, a piece that I saw at a, a, a VR festival, but it's about the Dead Sea and it really takes you to the place and it tells you a story about it. A Coral Compass, Finding Climate Change and Palau is another piece from Jeremy Balenson. Um, and then Beyond the Diorama from USC, uh, again, sort of taking you into this world and telling you the story of what's happening with climate change. So again, it, this is the combination of active presence, mental social presence, embodied environmental presence, and emotional presence. Okay, the last thing, and then we'll, we'll move on to the questions here, some just strategies for building. So you have the cone of experience where you have like the most uh, embodied experience and environment, and then you have different aspects of the drama and the story from the emotional presence, and then the, the field trip and be able to actually express your agency, and then the, the mental and social presence. And so you can think about different ways of the immersive experiences are trying to get down here to the environmental presence, but you're adding different components on top of that. So this is just one way of, as you're starting to translate this, um, there's a same model of education technology diffusion, which the first part is replicating what's already there and having the new technology and replicating existing things. And then you eventually find the new uh, affordances of the technology as you continue to progress out. So there's a big emphasis of this, you know, aspect of skeuomorphism and skeuomorphic design. So like taking the iPad and then taking what's it like to read a book on the iPad and having this very skeuomorphic design, which if you're a Kindle reader, there, this may actually not be the best reading experience, but they're trying to like get you familiar with what it was like to read a book on this new platform. And I think there's a lot of that's happening within VR right now. So the skeuomorphs and cultural algorithms, this, you know, taking what's there before and adding it on top of it. Uh, there's a lot of talk that was when the iPad came out based upon some of this research that came out in 1998, but it goes way back to 1889, uh, H. Colley March. Uh, the etymology is the vessel and the implement and the forms. And so it'll be convenient to call things that are sort of modulated from the similar structure as the skewmorph. So there's a lot of skewmorphic design that's happening right now. And from that skewmorphism, you're looking at the previous media. So from writing, theater, film, radio, TV, video games, internet, mobile phone. So VNR AR is at the top here, looking downward on all these other previous media and, and using this sort of skewmorphic designs of what was best for a video game, what was best for the internet, what was best for film, what was best for theater, and trying to do this translation. And that's a lot of what's happening right now. So generally, that's a general strategy of this kind of skeuomorphic approach, uh, but also kind of Bloom's taxonomy with the, at the basic level, you can start down at the remember, understand, and apply. But as you get into the real constructivist, it gets into the more analyze, evaluate, creating aspect. And so, you know, getting to the higher level of Bloom's taxonomy, I think is where XR really um, shines. Um, but, and then so just some ideas around the genesis, custom-built product and commodity, just to kind of uh, wrap things up here. Um, so you have technology that diffuses over time and it takes time for something to go from just an idea out into mass ubiquity. So we've seen how that happens over the years, but uh, Simon Worley has created this you know, model that has four distinct phases. There's the idea, the custom bespoke aspect, the product, and then the commodity. So to break that out, there's the prototype and the genesis, 
the custom built enterprise application, the consumer product and the ubiqu ubiquitous uh, commodity. So the, the initial prototype of VRs in 1968 was the sort of Damocles. Then we had these custom bespoke enterprise applications with the VPL in 1989. And then you have this consumer VR that comes from 2012 to 2019 with all these different you know, headsets that released between that period. And then you eventually get to this ubiquitous point. But you don't, you don't get to ubiquity until you go through these other phases. And so we're still kind of in that custom built enterprise app from a software side, even though we have consumer VR technology. So this is a map from Simon Wardley where he tries to sort of take that Genesis custom built product and commodity and map it out. So here on the far end is all the different low level infrastructure that is basically like open source commodities like cloud computing and electricity, you know? And then you have things that are more commercial off the shelf things like Unity and all these other things that we have within the ecosystem. And then you have the process of actually making the experiences which is a lot of like, you gotta do a lot of things by hand. There's not a lot of things to do that automated. So if we look at that in the context of the XR system, you have Blender, which is like an open source uh, model that's at a, at a commodity phase where it's free to use, but there's Maya if you wanna pay more money, but most people are using Blender at this point. Um, we have Sketchpad for models, but a lot of people are still building their own models. And that takes a lot of handcrafted um, you know, time to actually make that. And then there's a lot of code to be able to, to actually do that. So there's Unreal Engine and Unity, which is which is great, but you know, there's, in the commodity phase, but it's not, you know, totally into this phase where it's mass ubiquitous. Um, and we have like YouTube as a distribution platform, also Steam and, and Oculus and Engage, but also Mozilla Hubs is also here in terms of something that is commodified with, with WebXR. So that that's just to give you a sense of sort of the, the production pipeline and, you know, how are you sort of managing all that? There's a lot of hand holding that has to happen because in order to create the experiences, you have you're still in this custom hand built phase, even though there's other aspects of the ecosystem that are over here. Uh, but there's also the dynamic of like there's 229, 292 experiences on the go for uh, VR, but basically seven on the Oculus Quest. Uh, there's been not only the curation for the Quest that has not actually curated. You have to go to App Lab or SideQuest, but even to have a Quest with an education space is difficult. So we've seen a huge drop off from 292 experiences on the go to seven on the quest. And so uh, where do you go to get those experiences? Uh, how do you get in the hands if you do have a quest? And we're kind of in this agile iterative uh, process that, I, you know, again, is a, what I recommend. Um, and it, there's some other points here just in terms of the, the, the that I think I, I might skip over just for the sake of time, because it just sort of the design philosophies I've talked about before, um, you know, this sort of human considered design where you're trying to really understand all the different aspects and then design for that. Um, so that's the introduction, the, all the different aspects of the design frameworks, the ethics, the tech culture, models of perception, cognition, presence theory, education ethics, and brief survey of, of what's happening and sort of the strategies for building. So I know that it was a lot, but thanks for your patience. And I'll sort of stop and dive into the Q&A and discussion. I can. Okay, cool. So for some reason, my video doesn't want to start again. Let me see that I can actually get this up. Uh, thanks for the presentation. This is an interesting overview. I'm going to reconnect my camera. How sad. Um, here we go. No, we don't. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so, um, yeah, now we start improvising. Uh, okay, we do improvise. <laughs> backup camera. I always have a backup camera. Here we go. One sec. So, here we are. Kent, how do you feel? So this was a great overview of uh, a lot of the topics and, and, and issues that you um, care deeply about. Um, I know that it's um, not straightforward to provide like, um, like a, a framework that like the most concrete takeaway, like if I were an educator right now, like what would I, what would I need to pay attention to? There was a lot of stuff that you touched on. So- yeah. It's um, it's tricky. I uh, would like to get this discussion started. I received one question in a side channel with some of my students from my AIVR courses are also attending. And I really love this one question is posted anonymously. And I wanted to ask you this one first. Uh, is there one particular framework you would recommend for teachers or instructors who may be novices to XR and uh, related ethical issues? Uh, a lot of us are concerned about doing the right or wrong thing, right? What if I create a learning experience that not every student can participate in? 
due to some of the factors you just talked about. And you didn't even mention motion sickness and, and some of these things. So uh, how would you recommend they apply the, that framework, uh, if there is one, in deciding whether or not to use XR in the classroom and selecting designing appropriate experiences? Yeah, I think that the, the challenge with ethics is that you can never really do it perfect on all dimensions. And so what I recommend actually is to have your own direct experience with a lot of these different experiences. And then from there, see what you know from your own direct experience and then what you think as an educator might translate well into whatever learning objective that you might have. Because as I've looked out, I've gone to a lot of the, um, like the Oculus had like a whole uh, education thing that they did before Oculus, or the, the, face, the last Oculus Connect that happened back in uh, 2019. And there's a lot of, uh, published research and stuff that works and doesn't work. And, you know, I think uh, in the absence of you actually having that same director experience, sometimes it's hard to sort of fully translate all the different learnings and insights from that. And so taking a look at some of those, you know, publicly available experiences and then trying to figure out how to basically build out, like you can think of, like, I didn't get into this a lot uh, just because like, if you just wanted to build a world, you can, you know, create that in Mozilla hubs and have people go into a world and then have like a social interaction there where people can be there and together and you can talk with other people. Now, in terms of adding interactivity and agency, WebXR is not great for that. There's maybe other platforms like Engage that may be better to have more interactive aspects or potentially even things like commercial apps like Rec Room or, you know, people use Minecraft or, um, you know, Roblox is going to be more and more uh, people building their own aspects. And so there, I think there's the ways of like the immersed experience of the environment. Then there's the social dimension of are you able to have people interact with each other? Then there's the agency interactivity. Do you have any gamified elements that are coming from people actually interacting with it? Or is it more about you showing people and having their own ex experience with something? Um, and then there's like, is there a narrative arc or what's the thing that really hooks people in terms of the, the narrative that's sort of tying it all together? So um, I'd say that there, there has been a quite, actually, if you, if you fire up the Oculus Go, there's, like I said, 292 experiences that are there. There's probably more experiences that you could check out on the go than there are on the quest. And hopefully there'll be a way to port those experiences from the go over to the quest. But in terms of ethics in particular, I think that, you know, so that's just the basis in terms of like, you know, getting your own sense of the medium and your own understanding of the medium. And then from there, designing experiences that are taking advantage of those new affordances of the medium. Um, in terms of the ethical landscape of all these different issues, uh, I think the uh, approach from the E3 XR, where it has the baseline of the ethics, and then it has the education, and then on top is eudaimonia. I think actually, I, I like that in terms of because you can't do everything perfectly. So you have to make a choice as to what things that you are going to really emphasize. Like you're going to definitely not violate anybody's privacy and you're, you're going to have everything be FERPA compliant. In some ways, that baseline of ethics are like, what are the laws you have to follow as an educator? That you're not violating those laws, but also like just making sure that if you have a classroom that has a broad, diverse range of uh, ethnicities, then you don't want to have a social VR experience that doesn't reflect that same level of diversity. So, but it if it if you're in a context where that at, isn't as much of an issue, then that may be a, less of a priority. So that's why I'm, I think that the 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 selection of different things that you're prioritizing or not are going to be really dependent on your context of who your audience is, but also what those contexts are, as well as the harm that can come if you don't do that, which is, you know, there could be undue harm that is made from one person that uh, makes you really look at to algorithmic, you know, issues that there may be algorithms or whatnot. So I think, you know, balancing those different trade-offs is a part of the essence of the dilemmas of our 21st century technology, which is a lot of what you see with Facebook, with yeah. You know, they've come up with their responsible innovation dimensions, which are trying to be like, how do you, when you get to the scale of like 3 billion people, how do you decide like, what is the worst harm between some of these different things? So I think that that's a, like at a micro scale though, at your classroom, you have the same exact thing, which is that you have to use your own ethical judgment. And I think part of the, the, the advantage of frameworks like this is that if you get a general sense of some of these things, you can start to extrapolate out with whatever your context is and what you may need to be able to take care of. Right. And I was, um, I, 
the funniest thing happened here on Zoom. So I was trying to fix the camera. Right now, I cannot actually see my own camera, but I, I believe you can see me. Yeah, we can so, see you. <laughs> okay, that's good. I, at least I see you. Oh, um, so I think this is, um, yeah, this is cool. Um, uh, what I have had, what I really appreciated uh, in the presentation is how you went uh, through some of the educational experiences uh, that you've seen. Many of of them are from actually from some recent, even twenty twenty one. So I think that's good. So the you did say obviously there's a huge difference in in terms of the applications, learning applications. Let's say that we have available on the Quest. Uh, many would argue that the Quest is is the medium of choice right now. In fact, they cannot buy the Oculus Go anymore. Cardboard discontinued. So a lot of interesting slash questionable movements in the education space. Google Expeditions uh, was one of the the main platforms used by many teachers, and it was just discontinued. So I'm I'm wondering, do you think um, so? How would you explain the uh, that we don't actually have so many applications available on the Quest? And do you think it's just a matter of time? Uh, is it just, do you think that a lot of people need to port some of these experiences? Very, the Go ones, just to be clear, are all 360 based. So relatively simple uh, in terms of their use of AR, or sorry, in their use of VR. But I'm just wondering, what do you think, what are your expectations for the Quest and some of the learning experiences you might see there? Well, I would, I would go back to a thing that I've mentioned briefly, but really emphasize the fact that WebXR is still nascent in, in terms of it being able to go where it's at now and where it's going to be at the future. Right now, the absolute best experiences that if you want to build are going to be on Unity and on Unreal Engine. But there's going to be things like WebXR and the Godot Engine, which is like an open source engine that I don't know if it can actually render out WebXR yet, but using the web browser. So there's the Oculus browser where you can go in and you don't have to deal with say the app lab, which is the same as an Oculus store, but you have to send people a direct link and they have to click on it and download it and, you know, put it onto their app. And that's sort of assuming that people already have like ownership of different things. So I think if you are able to send people a URL, then they go to the immersive experience and they're able to actually like Mozilla hubs is a great experience, a great example of being able to have that same pipeline of creating these experiences and maybe have some more social interactions with your classroom. And if they don't have VR, you could still be able to potentially participate on your 2D phone or, you know, something like Rec Room is on uh, both the uh, immersive quest, it's on PC VR, it's on 2D version um, on your console, on PS4, Xbox, and then iOS and Android. I think that model for what Rec Room has done is going to eventually come to the web as well, where you have a web experience and if people don't have a VR headset, they can look at it on their tablet or their phone or their PC. And they're able to still have enough of an experience of having a 2D windowed portal access into that world <clears throat> rather than being fully immersed. You know, I think it's better to be fully immersed, but if people don't have access to it, then <clears throat> that's a way that you could start to get people access to some of these technologies using something like WebXR, even if you don't have like, Full diffusion of the, the fully immersion, immersive version of that. Yeah, I appreciate that you emphasize the potential future role and importance of, of a standard like WebXR. Like the, the whole point of the web was to provide an open platform. And in, uh, to me, it's very exciting to see uh, that we are making improvement at the technical technological level. I mean, the Oculus browser on the Quest um, 2 right now provides good support for the WebXR API. I think we had some major setbacks with Mozilla basically just getting rid of their entire XR team that included some of my friends. Um, but I, I think it's good. You also saw hubs in, in some of your uh, examples. So it's like, what would be a good, like if a teacher wants to bring VR into their classroom, what, what would you recommend to them? It's like, okay, so obviously you would say, think about the learning goals, the context and all, all that kind of stuff. But if somebody just wants to have an experience with their students in a virtual classroom, what, what would be your approach right now? The lowest hanging fruit approach kind of, what would you say to them? Well, the, the lowest hanging fruit would be to find a video on Veer VR or YouTube VR that maybe takes people to a place and it's a passive 360 experience where people have the experience, but it does, it's not, very complicated to have to produce it. It's already been produced for you. You're just using it and have people <clears throat> kind of set a, a context for people. And then I think the next level would be 
create and to like say Mozilla hubs where people could then <clears throat> go in there and have a shared social, like, well, then they would have, you know, there, or your own website, like without hubs, if you want to just upload that mm -hmm. and send people a link to that, people could go look at it and there wouldn't be any social interaction. In order to get the social interaction, you would need to have something at the next higher up level, which would be like something like uh, hubs in order to have people actually be there at the same time. So then the next level would be to have like a shared social presence there together as a class. And then the next step would be to have right. interactivity and have coding because that engage uh, that requires either like it's not very easy to do interactive experiences on Mozilla Hubs. But that's where you would need to potentially have to go to like say Unreal Engine or Unity and start to do coding and have a whole other pipeline. And then the distribution is a little bit more difficult to get into people's hands. But I think that's sort of like you know the emotional presence of the 360 video emotional immersion just a passively received. Then the embodied experience, maybe they're able to look a mode around uh, into a, a place and show them. And then the next level of being able to uh, have a shared social experience. And so there's the things that are happening with the group dynamics. So it could be a whole wide range of different right. things, uh, guided tour or whatnot. Uh, and then the next is sort of interactivity and agency that the whole being like the hollow lab from shell games is probably the most sophisticated education game that I've seen mm -hmm. uh, really well polished, really well done, very well gamified but also gives you the sense of uh, actually engaging with the lab equipment. And that also is coming from like a world-class game designer who has you know, been in the game for decades and is at the, the peak of his own competency of a whole game design studio that's able to even generate a piece like that. That's why that map of like the custom bespoke area, it requires a lot of subject domain knowledge to be able to create an experience like that. Eventually, over time, it's going to be easier to say, like, go into Rec Room. Like, in Rec Room, you can collaboratively build things, and you can actually create collaborative interactivity. So if you wanted to create, if you wanted to be immersed in VR and create a collaborative interactive experience, then Rec Room is probably the best right now to be able to do that. Um, there's Roblox and Minecraft, but it's not, like, fully immersive VR yet. Um, and with VR Chat, you have to do it, and, uh, and, and also Altspace, you have to do it offline and upload it. Also, Engage... I, Engage actually has a lot of uh, interactive, collaborative um, creation tools as well. And if you want to go into VR and create the VR experiences, then I'd also recommend Engage as a good platform to be able to start to do that. And, and Engage is really tuned to be able to be serving the educational market. Right. Okay, cool. So this was, I really like how you how you break down the landscape. It is obviously a massive landscape, but people like you have a, have a really good overview and a sense of, of direction. So um, I want to go into some of maybe the darker sides of the, of the talk and the topic. So I want to ask a question from uh, Till Scholick, who is also a student in my AIVR course. Um, and he's picking up on, on something you touched on uh, during the presentation regarding mass media. Do you think if people were to constantly consume AR VR experiences, especially while navigating the real world, it could create more division and polarization because people experience the world in different ways, kind of like the filter bubbles of social media, but even stronger. So this is maybe about the AR cloud and um, some of those trends, um, but uh, up to you how you interpret the question. It's, it's an interesting one. Yeah, so I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing with Facebook in terms of the relationship between technology and societal issues is because they have a platform that has 3 billion people and they have algorithms that can selectively choose what to amplify to those people. And so that's been the whole crux of the issue. If you were just only following people that you knew, then it wouldn't be as much of an issue than saying the algorithmic suggestions and recommendations, but also making sure that people... Uh, and the chronological view, see uh, that they've made a like a, a a digital twin of you, and they they're making judgments as to what they think the, that you want to see. So yeah, this this level of algorithms and the ways that our algorithms are interfacing with our lives, we have no transparency or no way of kind of interfacing with these with these companies to be able to have a dialogue. <clears throat> so in some ways, there's a lack of resilience that has come with having a network of three billion people. And the, the countervailing force is to sort of decentralize and have smaller groups that are not like that big or to slow down the spread of information. The good thing, there's a couple of good things with VR, which is one, it's small. So you're not having the same exponential network effects of 3 billion people. It's like on the order of millions of people. But also in order to have an experience with an XR, it's not like sharing a video on a tweet that you watch for 10 seconds or you know a hot take that someone has. 
uh, you have to actually have the experience, which is more like reading a book. You have to dedicate yourself and have the time. Mm -hmm. So by its nature, XR is, is more resilient to that kind of like viral spread because of the nature that people actually have to commit to having that experience. However, when people do commit those experiences, it could actually communicate a lot of really powerful information. And there's ways to give people embodied experiences that are not connected to the larger context of the facts of what's happening. So sort of experiential warfare using fake news to create whole embodied experiences to, to serve a, a rhetorical need that is maybe uh, serving some sort of political power is an issue that is, I think, inevitable. But I think it's maybe more resilient to some of those because it's more of like the word of mouth thing. It, maybe it's like, hey, I had this experience, you have to actually see it. And it's using those other network effects faster because it, it's it's harder to get the word out about these experiences within the media. So there are maybe some separations like that, but uh, this this starts to get into like the issues that maybe go beyond what educators are gonna be concerned with because these are kind of like issues where the government's gonna need to be able to come in and start to regulate and set different policy issues to be able to address some of these different issues that we're seeing because I mean, but there's no real answer to that right now, which is a bit of the dilemma. Well, sort of, it's, it yeah. is interesting the way you think about it. So, I mean, we've done a few studies with uh, one of my PhD students here, for example, in the lab, Shweta Rajaram, she did actually a uh, study with, with high school teachers, uh, allowing them to envision the use of AR in their classrooms. And they have been teaching for up to, uh, some, some of them have been teaching for 30 years. So how do you get teachers uh, who have been practitioners uh, for, for 30 years, how do you get them to think about adopting AR, for example, in the classroom and in a variety of domains? And what, one thing that they thought was particularly promising with this technology is the degree of personalization. You can actually really provide a very personalized learning experience. You can support students that have specific needs in, 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 in actually in a very meaningful way. But the result of this could be that you and I may try out the same thing, but if you and I go to the same movie, it's interesting. We'll probably be able to talk about the same things unless you paid attention to, to, <laughs> to something else. But with these XR experiences that right now are really actually quite static and very, uh, actually very basic still, uh, in the future, it could lead to some very interesting uh, challenges. And so it's another way to think about this question that maybe is relevant in education. So less about the who owns the market kind of thing and like is a Tesla mapping out the world for us or should it be Google <laughs> uh, and the AR cloud and who sees what, even though we're at the same location kind of, I, I really like those kinds of considerations, but even in the classroom, uh, an individualized learning experience, um, wonder whether that can lead to some interesting issues in the future as well. Well, I think that, you know, the frontier of biometric data is happening in the medical field, um, but also in corporate training, we're starting to integrate higher levels of, you know, being able to, to measure your, your, your blood flow to be able to get proxies for how much stress you may be having or looking your eyes to be able to extrapolate cognitive load mm -hmm. uh, through, through eye tracking. <clears throat> so with the, the HP Omnicept edition as an example, where there's different you know, training applications that are using some of these biometric markers, but we are, and I've, I've attended the, the neuro gaming conference uh, a couple of mm -hmm. times, which then turned into the experiential technology conference. <clears throat> but from there, it's the idea of taking this biometric data and trying to assess the, the where the student is having struggling from, from the cognitive load perspective, and then either amplifying it to give them more challenge or to sort of more do like there's game design <clears throat> excuse me, game design theory that is already trying to like map out the sort of progression of difficulty, but to be more dynamic and to be listening and to be able to really understand where a student may be at and to know where they need to be at to be challenged. The dilemma with that, I think, is that in order to really do that, like you're sort of alluding to, is that you may need to have like really personalized data. And so where is that data at? Preferably it'd be within the hands of the student. They'd be able to own and control it. It wouldn't be, it would be on the edge rather than up on the cloud. But as things like this go, it ends up going on the cloud. And then if it's, you know, but there's privacy issues there in terms of, is that going to be for compliant? If there's going to be aspects of biometric data, that's going to be personally identifiable because there's ways in which that we give unique fingerprints of our data that's coming off our body. And if that's something that's going to be very useful for being able to measure in real time, then recording that data is going to be an issue as we move forward. Uh, so we have to figure out as an industry or as an educational subsection of like, what are the you know, just like the medical industry has HIPAA compliance that they have to follow, then are there kind of equivalent FERPA compliant 
uh, ways of protecting private information to be able to do that level of personalization without sacrificing someone's uh, core identity. Uh, that's right. I mean, you're speaking directly to some of the challenges we are experiencing here in the X Initiative as the University of Michigan, who is a public, that is a public institution, we actually have to be both FERPA and HIPAA compliant. So uh, it is, it is uh, at least in some of the courses, because we use a lot of it in, in the medical domain as well. So it is uh, really speaking to a lot of the issues uh, we experience. So, um, okay, so I'm, I'm scanning um, whether there have been other questions. One, one comment raise. that I one comment that I, I think is worth mentioning was that the map is not the territory. And I, sometimes I use that. I use a lot of maps and I think it's helpful that every map is imperfect and incomplete. And mm -hmm. so I'm a, a diehard pluralist, meaning that you have to have many different maps that you're adding together in order to get the full picture. So with every map that I have, uh, that's why I wanted to show other academic maps and other options for people to dig into. Uh, the maps I use are based upon my own phenomenological experiences and ways that I make sense of things, but um, there's going to be other maps that are out there to try to, you know, uh, do that. But and I'll, I'll pass it back to you. I just wanted to comment oh, on that. that that's what I thing. appreciate in the in the beginning of the presentation. You were and throughout you were giving shout outs to various places here and there. I mean, it, it demonstrated first of all who we have with us today can buy who really knows his stuff, but also not just his own stuff. Uh, so it has a very good overview of, of, of different theories. So in the discussion, I tried to break it down a little bit uh, to, into some practical advice. I know that some of the uh, instructors are, are joining us and then obviously a lot of the students are here as well and so like uh, uh, Kent so I was, I was wondering uh, did you as a student <laughs> or I'm not sure how you think about it um, experience things close to VR and what what do you do you have a, a dark future <laughs> that you see for us or do you think we can get this right and is there a bright future in learning what what is your overall uh, impression of of of, uh, where we are going. I mean, you've definitely highlighted a lot of, a lot of concerns. Uh, just to give one context, so tomorrow I'm going to give a presentation at Interpol, uh, who bring together more than 100 countries, uh, mostly actually police <laughs> sergeants listening to me and thinking about how we might use XR in the future to, to train, uh, how to solve crimes, how to, uh, you know, actually conduct themselves in public, how to really follow protocols and things like that. And so uh, this is a very interesting audience um, that really cares about training and using VR. And um, I'm very skeptical at this stage, see what we have, but I'm wondering how you see it. So bright future, or um, do we have still a lot of obstacles? What do you think? I think in terms of the content creation, it's boundless and I'm extremely optimistic. In terms of the larger platform and the monopolization of the platforms and sort of control and surveillance capitalism and all the ways that creates it in an environment where it may not actually be a viable environment for educators to work in because they're not FERPA compliant. So because of that, I feel like the biggest issue is around the more monopoly, the, the way that big tech runs our lives and, and that the way that they're kind of doing what they want and there's no you know blowback or antitrust enforcement or tech policy that's viable to be able to help rein in some of these different issues around privacy. So I think that's where my concern is, is around those larger issues that end up being the highest leverage way to do that is through tech policy and the law and governments. But um, in terms of the content, I'm extremely excited and I think it's boundless. And I think it's we're gonna be surprised about what's possible. That's why I think things like WebXR and these more open alternatives are gonna be a big part of how people are getting access to all this stuff. Um, and, you know, for me personally, I, in terms of my own experiences, you know, I, you know, graduated college in 1998. So this is way before any of this that I've done anything with <clears throat> XR uh, for, for many, many years. But when I, I will say that my process of learning is very much going into these Doing. conferences and being able to have direct conversations with subject matter experts, mm -hmm. being able to ask a subject matter expert a question that I'm curious about is by far the best way that I learn. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I have an intention. I'm highly motivated. I want to know the answer. And I'm talking with people who have to know the answer and they tell me and I share it with the world uh, through the podcast. So that process, I think actually is a really good model of learning because I'm just insatiably curious and my whole process is about trying to talk to all these different people and, and really get their own accounts of things uh, on top of my own reading of whatever artifact they've produced. Um, and I think VR provides an opportunity for a lot more of that to happen, for people to yeah, have right. that, those types of embodied interactive, engaged, one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who are subject matter experts within a contextually relevant environment that's gonna be beneficial to learning. 
Right. Okay, cool. Thank you, Kent, again, for spending the time with us and for your thoughtful overview. I'm wondering, Jeremy, do you have any closing words for us as we wrap things up? This was great. We It was a fascinating presentation, great discussion. Really appreciate your time, Kent. We'd love to stay connected as we move forward and help help other institutions that are just getting into this space and how do they, how do they stay ahead of some of these ethical and privacy and security issues as they begin to implement initiatives across the country and the globe. Yeah, and I, I'd recommend folks uh, check out my slide share at Kent by. Uh, I'm gonna be uploading the slides if you wanna get more information. Uh, I'll post the, the tweet on my Twitter if you wanna go check that out, twitter.com slash Kent by. I'm at voices of VR. Uh, dot com if you want to listen to the podcast and uh, also have some YouTube videos from other talks if you're curious about more deeper dives. This this was sort of a very slim down version of the ethics, but there's been longer talks that I, I've given on both privacy and ethics that, you know, I wanted to really cover a lot of the educational stuff here. But thanks so much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be able to talk to other educators and folks in this space. And if you are in this space, it's very early still. And so congratulations, you're on the bleeding edge of what's to come. And there's a lot of hard things that I have custom bespoke handcrafted to still figure out and uh, a lot of open ethical questions as a society that have still yet to be figured out as well. But it's an exciting time to be involved and uh, feel free to reach out and get connected and let me know what you're up to. So thanks. Thank you so much. And please join us back on November 4th where Michael and I will talk about XR for everybody. Have a great day. Bye everybody. Thanks for coming.